So today is part of the Finding Petroleum series, looking at super basins, and we're going to try and determine the Premier League of source rocks. What is a Premier League of source rocks? Here's the answer. Look at all these source rocks, some of which you'll know, some of which you won't, right across some basins in the world. Uh, not all. We've got to other areas that are missing. Take your pick. But what are we looking for? Well, there appears to be two areas in the evolving scientific literature. On the one hand, there's the sort of the geochemistry, the uh, petroleum geochemistry, mainly kind of centered around the uh, conventional oil and gas deposits, which looks at the source rocks, the maturation, petroleum systems, etc. And then we also have the unconventionals, which are the sort of the oil shales, the shale gas, and the uh, the tight oil. Now, I sometimes think of this latter set as sort of the working petroleum systems without a decent reservoir, or, well, or source rocks which haven't yet expelled hydrocarbons. How can we summarise source rocks globally? As you can see, we can come up with a huge list of, of alternative source rocks, but how do we arrive at a Premier League? So just to remind ourselves, here uh, in a one-slide summary is what a source rock is. And here's a definition. Rocks, almost exclusively sedimentary rocks, which contain sufficient organic material and attain thermal maturity to expel hydrocarbons. And I think that's very simple and, and, and yet a good definition. One great exception is, of course, uh, the biogenic gas, which doesn't actually have to attain a, a thermal maturity. It can generate gas whilst thermally immature. Within the source rock, we have all the macerals. They are the uh, the minerals of, of organic matter. So we have in here pictures of inertinite, vitrinite, both colonite and telonite. We've got the amorphous uh, organic material. We've got uh, classic exonite. And, and these are the various constituents of organic material in a source rock. Now, it doesn't include the, the spores, algae, and other types of material that we might find. And then we could look at it in terms of a, some kind of elemental analysis. This is a, a Van Crevelin type diagram where we're plotting the, the amount of hydrogen or the ratio of hydrogen on one axis against the ratio of oxygen to carbon on, on the other axis. And you can see we can have different types of, of, of source rock, the uh, types 1, type 2 and type 3. And all of them uh, tend to follow a, uh, a maturation pathway from immature through into uh, the oil window, through the wet gas window, towards the dry gas, and ultimately towards a sort of charcoal or dead carbon. In this case, not all of these macerals here will actually generate oil. They may go through the oil window, but if they don't have the constituent parts, the chemistry that's going to generate oil, they may have to wait until they get past this threshold here and get into the, the, the gas generating window. In this particular slide here, we also have to be aware of the, the maturation history. We can get some basins where the source rock essentially just a continuous sedimentation. It just gets buried deeper and deeper, hotter and hotter, and starts generating hydrocarbons. In other basins, which are, have got a more complex tectonic history, uh, we can see this uh, this burial gets interrupted by some kind of an orogenic event. There's been uplift and, and erosion. And what we could say about these, the source rocks in a basin like this is that they've probably attained their maximum temperature or at their maximum depth of burial. And essentially, the, the reactions are frozen thereafter, and there would be little generation in this last, say, 10 million years. But the bulk of the generation would be in the sort of 20 to 10 million years before present. Another way of looking at it, and, and this is kind of looking at the maturity through either vitronite reflectance or spore coloration index or some other maturation parameter. And you can see here as we go down uh, with increasing depth and a, a global average of around about 30 degrees centigrade per kilometer as we go through the Earth's crust. Initially, we get this uh, biogenic methane. Uh, it doesn't need heat, so it can be generated at shallow depths. Uh, then we pass in through the, the oil window, and progressively we would see uh, the heavier oils at first coming towards the lighter oils and condensates towards the, the base of, of the oil window. And then there's some thermal cracking. But also, um, depending on what the kerogen type is, we could bypass the oil and go straight into a, a wet gas and then dry gas phase. 
ultimately here it's showing going all the way to, to graphite, which is almost uh, kind of getting into the metagenesis or metamorphic uh, terrain. The other thing we need to know about source rocks, and particularly if we're trying to predict them, is to understanding the uh, the upwelling of, of nutrients from deep waters into a shallower. and They can actually lead to uh, anoxic events. We can have a look at the paleoclimate, and we'll see this in a later slide. We tend not to get uh, our source rocks deposited at very high latitudes. A discharge or sedimentation rate, uh, we can see that sometimes, you know, that could actually dilute the organic material to the point where it can't actually escape out of the, uh, the source rock itself. And if it's a very, very low rate, or it could be a, a carbonate environment, we could, we could get there more of the sort of algal kerogens, uh, which would give us the type 1 or oil-prone source rocks. And finally, circulation, and that's oceanic circulation. Circulation. If there's a lot of circulation of, of oceanic waters, they can be quite oxic. So we have to look for anoxia, which is, of course, reducing environments, a lack of oxygen. That leads to the preservation of organic material. What we often hear, the present is the, is the key to the past. Well, when we look at source rocks, well, is it? So let's look at the present, and here on this map, we can see various red dots. So here in the sort of Kattegat, in the Baltic, in small patches within the Mediterranean Sea, the Black Sea, and the Caspian Sea. Also, you can see within an inlet here near Vancouver, another very, very small area is in this Orca Basin. Uh, a local little anoxic area. Uh, and likewise, another gulf here, which is uh, quite close to Caracas. Now, we're excluding anoxic lakes in here. These are where source rocks or where anoxia is, is present today, and this is where we preserve organic material and generate source rocks. However, we don't find too many source rocks in this, uh, this open oceanic waters. Uh, this is one of the sort of the exceptions. Most of these are in very restricted uh, in, inland sea type uh, settings. If we look at the global distribution of source rock, well, one way to get there is to look at the global distribution of oil and gas. Well, where is it? Well, just about everywhere. Um, that's not strictly true, but you can see every red dot and green dot in here is, is showing the distribution of of known uh, discoveries or fields uh, throughout the world. And we can see concentrations of those. And on here, it's Eddie Yong is actually highlighted the main tight oil resources and the main shale gas resources in various parts of the planet. So everywhere these occur, we know there is a source rock. There must be. We can look at that in terms of a very high level at uh, the, the geology, and we can see that you know there's unlikely to be uh, source rocks associated with shield environments or, for that matter, orogenic belts, but some. But then we see that uh, the, the major area where we see the hydrocarbons are in the basins and the extended crusts. We do see that the majority of source rocks occur between the, uh, the equator and and 40 degrees north and south. The places that we won't find them are in igneous and metamorphic cratons. We won't find uh, source rocks developed at high latitudes in de paleo deserts, paleo ice caps. Um, we won't find them where there's, uh, there's moratoria, where we can't drill. Um, there are areas where we, we won't find out what the petroleum system is all about and if there is a working mature source rock. And in areas that are essentially uh, undrilled, and of course, until recently, a lot of the deep water was uh, was un undrilled. This is a, a phenomenon that's only come about in the last uh, two decades. Some areas have got potential, and we mark a few here. These are, these are areas which either have had moratorium or um, there's been very little drilling. One of the areas, I think, uh, of note is in the southern Atlantic, and, and there was... Um, this area now of the offshore Namibia in the Namib, Walvis and Luderitz Basin and across uh, its conjugate partner, the uh, Palatos Basin, offshore southern Brazil and uh, Uruguay. And this is not an exhaustive lift, but if we look at this area, we can see here that uh, there was a perceived wisdom. That was that there was a silled basin model, that all the West African oil fields and gas fields were being sourced by source rocks that were deposited in a restricted environment north of the uh, the Walvis Ridge, and that south of the Walvis Ridge, that there would be open uh, oceanic waters which would be oxic and they would 
actually mean that there would be no deposition of source rocks. But this is an old idea. And this map here that's uh, been put together by Jamie Vanells um, actually shows that, uh, you know, we have various uh, new discoveries uh, in 2022. Venus, Graf and Lorona by uh, Total and Shell. And most recently, we've got the Yonkers discovery in here. Want to very, very quickly run through the global source rocks. And we're going to have a look at 11 maps covering 600 million years. And we're going to look at it in six seconds. Now, the idea is you can just pause this and go. So we're going back through time into the Cretaceous, the Jurassic, and all these maps here. Actually, great compilations put together by Eddie Yong and uh, showing the, uh, the distribution through time. Uh, resource size, well, if we look at the resource size for source rocks, then we can see in this uh, study here that was actually conducted by EIA and ARI, they came up with a number of estimates for the amount of technical recoverable reserves in uh, both tight oil and in wet shale gas environments. And, and you can see here something like the Permian Basin has got hundreds of billions of barrels of oil. And some are like West Canada. We're talking about best part of 700 trillion cubic feet of gas uh, just in this one basin. And if you look down the list, you, you'll recognize many of these areas. This is a vast amount of uh, hydrocarbon that's, that's actually been generated in the area. Now, this one excludes tar sands, methane hydrates, and some other uh, hydrocarbon accumulations. So if you look at the six ages of major source rock development, now this is based on some work by uh, Rasul Stork Abbey. Well, this is a very complicated diagram, so pause the video and, and have a look at it. But what you'll see is that the major source rock ages here are highlighted from various different studies through time, starting with Bernard Tizo top left and going all the way down to Clemmie and Olmuth Shack back in 1991. They're picking out what they assess to be the major source intervals within the geological record. There is some commonality, although they're different, they get similar but different answers. They uh, show that, uh, you know, the Jurassic and Cretaceous are certainly very, very prominent periods of, of huge source rock deposition. To understand what is the basis of this, do they uh, include conventional and unconventional? Do they include the immature source rocks that uh, we know exist in many parts of the world? And do they actually uh, account for, probably not, the overmature source rocks that were once had generative uh, capability, but now uh, essentially uh, overmature through the, uh, the gas window, and, and now they're sort of dead carbon, inertinite, graphite, or whatever you uh, wish to call it. Having a look at this study... You can see these are the six intervals, which were periods when there were lots of source rocks deposited in this time. Now, not at all points within here, but certainly there are periods within here where there was extensive deposition of source rocks worldwide. In the interest of time, I'm going to go straight to the Cretaceous and just have a look at this and see that the Cretaceous, well, it was a period of, of rifting, the breaking up of the uh, Pangaea supercontinent. There was a lot of rifting volcanism. Things were warming up through the Cretaceous, maybe in part uh, due to the volcanism. And uh, this is the start of the drifting phase. Now, mid-Cretaceous source rocks, they're enigmatic insofar as they are hugely widespread. They tend to be the sort of type 2, type 3 kerogens, you know, mixed to uh, Gasparin kerogens. So um, we, we see that they produce both oil and gas. Uh, distribution, well, um, here are areas where we see them. And, and before we get to the, or by the end of the Cretaceous, we come to the mass extinction phase. Now that's not just the dinosaurs, but a lot of marine life also became extinct at that time. Compare that with the uh, the tertiary, and uh, as we go from the Paleogene to the Neogene, there's conti well, a continuation of the spreading from the uh, Cretaceous. But as we get later in time, we see these collisions of India with Asia, and lots of, um, lots of mountain building. There was the Himalayas, the Carpathians, the, the Alps, uh, all the way, and some of the um, volcanic mountain ranges as well that we see uh, on plate margins. But generally throughout the tertiary, cooling trends, lower sea levels um, with ocean spreading, um, there were lots of uh, transgressions and regressions within this time, which controlled the extent and the morphology of the uh, shallow sediments. Um, but this collision of continents, this mountain building, 
set about uh, diverse tectonic settings and and here are a few that are listed um, and some examples of where they are typically um, these uh, are where the uh, the type 2 and type 3 kerogens that we see in this region and and some of them actually um, responsible for the biogenic gas deposits that uh, we find today Looking at the Middle East case study, here's uh, various source rock formations, the Kaseba in the Silurian. We can see this in southern Arabia into northwest Oman. Uh, this is a prolific source. In fact, it is typed to be the source of a Gawa. And then we can see as we go further to the north, we get uh, areas of uh, Jurassic Cretaceous and even into a uh, tertiary source rock. The Arabian Peninsula was a, a relatively stable area with a lot of subsidence and relatively little significant uh, tectonic activity. Now, you know, here we can see that in 2021, we can see the importance of the Middle East for both oil and gas. It's only really uh, North America that uh, that comes anywhere close to the, the size of the reserves and the production, the Middle East region. Here's the basin setting as we go from west to east, from Saudi Arabia through Qatar, across into Iran. Here we have the Zagros thrust zone and we can see a lot of complex folding and thrusting uh, and we do see some accumulations of, of hydrocarbon particularly on the leading edge of the uh, thrust complex. As we go uh, further away in sort of the foreland area here we, we can kind of see that we've got accumulations of hydrocarbon in various areas. Here we see Gawar in the Arab carbonates, and over here we see uh, in the, the Kuf formation, again, carbonate reservoirs associated with the North Field. And these are a subject of two videos that we have on our channel. Now, if we look at, uh, have we collated this information for source rocks? Um, what we uh, have within each and every one of our regional trove databases is, we would have a, a section on geochemistry, and this is the one illustrating what's uh, part of the uh, the Middle East. And you can see maps discussing the source rock distribution. We also look at some of the uh, direct evidence for it, some of the burial histories, some of the studies that have been done. And is a great source of information to quickly find all the relevant source rock information in areas of the world. And we have this globally. In fact, together, uh, we've got uh, over 2,100 pages of uh, petroleum geochemistry, all collated worldwide. In total, across all the troves, well, we've got over a quarter of a million pages. So it is effectively an oil and gas encyclopedia to find out about oil fields, gas fields, some prospects, lots of information about the geology and uh, the infrastructure. It grows at about uh, 10 to 20 percent per annum and as it's collated everything that's relevant put in one place you can analyze slice and dice the data which is what we've done to create this geochemistry and of course it's very easy to use it was uh, designed for Excel novices and we've actually tested that. So uh, conclusions Source rocks, well, they require rich organic material and anoxic environments. Uh, the latter are very, very important to preserve the organic matter before it's oxidized and essentially it then loses uh, any generative uh, potential. The, uh, the composition and maturity of the organic matter help define what type of hydrocarbons are produced. Now, we recognize there are more learnings to come and, uh, you know, an example is that clearly there is a prolific source or number of source rocks in uh, offshore Namibia and uh, in other areas of the world as we drill wells and explore then we will undoubtedly uncover new source rocks. Some ages are favoured for widespread uh, source rock development um, but then we set out to say well you know we're going to come up with a uh, with a, a premier league of source rocks and well how do we do it? We look at the number of reserves in the area, the yield of a source rock, whether it's oil or gas, uh, whether it's uh, immature um, source rock, uh, conventional, unconventional, or even the over-mature, the former source rocks. Very kind of uh, subjective. We've come up with our list, and it really is pretty arbitrary, but, uh, you know, the Kasabian Calabar, responsible for the super giant fields of uh, Saudi Arabia, in particular Gawa. We see the Bazhevnov formation uh, over in Siberia, thought to be responsible for much of the hydrocarbon accumulations in the eastern Russia. 
Then we've got the famous Cretaceous, the Aptian, Cinnamonian, Chironian source rocks that we see in many parts of the world, including the Southern Atlantic. The Kanji Formation in the news a lot with the uh, recent significant finds in the uh, Suriname and Guyana area. La Luna, a fantastic source rock in Venezuela. We could have chosen one of many of the shales uh, in the basins in uh, North America. Here's just some examples. Our very own uh, Kimmeridge clay here in the North Sea and rocks like the Shublik in the uh, Alaska. It is an arbitrary list. It's here just uh, for people to add and to comment. Do you agree with our listing? What have we missed out? Please leave comments. We just make the point here, we're not including something like the Orinoco and Athabasca tar sands in this uh, evaluation. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, subscribe, ring that bell. Look forward to seeing you back on our channel. Bye for now.